This is Ichari Bachode, an Okinawan Voices and Stories podcast. Episode 11 The Intersection of Connections on Being Okinawan and Kanaka Maoli. In this podcast, we aim to create an open and safe learning and growing space where we'll explore alongside guest speakers what it means to be Shimanchu. Our intention and prayer for this project is to cultivate our knowledge about our histories, to celebrate the amazingly diverse and resilient culture of our people, to inspire other Shimanchu of all generations and geographic locations to be curious about their histories, to preserve those precious pieces of our identity for future generations, and of course, to have fun along the way. We'll laugh, we'll cry, we'll stumble around and be human. We hope you'll join us for this evolving journey together. Yitasarugutu, unige sabida. Hi, Sai. Welcome to episode 11 of the Ichariba Chore podcast. Wanne Erika Yaidin. My name is Erika Kunihisa, and today I'll be your co host alongside Mariko Middleton and Tori Toguchi. Yutasuku Unige Sabiria. We're here today with the wonderful Momi Cummings and Lehuo Uakea. I'd love to give this space to um, over to Momi and to Lehuo Uakea to introduce themselves. Um, let's go ahead and start with Momi. Hi, Sai. Kelhanui. One name Momi Yaidin. Um, I am a mixed Kanaka Oivi, Shimanchu, and Pinai person, born and raised in Wailua, Kauai. I currently reside in Aia O'ahu, um, and I am a fourth generation Shimanchu in Hawaii. Um, and my interest um, with relation to our Shimanchu community is in um, how we can reclaim our family histories and our genealogies in diaspora. Aloha mai kako. My name is Lehua Uakea. I am a mixed Native Hawaiian artist and kapa maker. Um, I'm originally from uh, Papaiko on the Big Island, born in Oregon, um, and now I, I, I live in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, but most of my family comes from the Hamakua coast on the Big Island, and I was raised Hawaiian and Japanese. And so, yeah, a lot of intersections there. Awesome. Iteni he debiru for your introduction and thank you for being on our podcast with us. This is our first episode of yearly episodes where we focus on communities outside of the Ryukyus and our intention with these communities. We also want to affirm and uplift the multidimensional identities of mixed race individuals whose experiences are part of the larger tapestry of our Ryukyu and diaspora community and to share their voices with our listeners. So with that, let's jump into the episode. All right. Um, So first off, um, I'd love to clarify the language that we're going to be using in this episode. Um, So the first question is, what does Hawaii mean to you? But I know that there are multiple words um, for this. So um, I'd love to hear from both of you on preference or what you use um, in terms of Hawaii versus Kanaka Maoli or Kanaka Oivi um, or anything else. I'd love context from you all. Um, yeah, so I guess, like, to me, Hawaii is, like, it's not necessarily just the place, it's also the people and the culture and the language that that place has given life to. Um, and so, you know, I, I use Native Hawaiians or Hawaiians interchangeably, but also um, Kanaka Oivi or Kanaka Maoli, like what we call ourselves in our own language. Um, Because I think it's just as important to recognize our own, uh, like, olalo and and that history embedded within those sounds. Um, Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think that they all kind of mean something similar, but slightly different, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I'll add to that, that, you know, there's a really interesting connection I noticed between... um, Shimanchu and Kanaka identity, which is that if you notice Lehua, Okea, and I both introduced ourselves specific to the island that we're from. So there's like the kingdom of Hawaii that's made up of an archipelago similar to the kingdom of Rikyu that's an archipelago. 
Um, and there might be kind of more focus or emphasis on like the main island, um, but it's really a diversity of experiences specific to each island. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and so that's just a really interesting connection and I think a, um, a piece of understanding that we can use to connect us. Um, yeah, so super interesting. Um, Hawaii as like an archipelago or what we might call the Paiaina um, as a unified kingdom is actually like super recent prior to contact. And so prior to that, um, I don't know if we would have like a pan Paiaina identity as our like foremost um, identifier. It might be kind of more specific to our families or the region or island that we're from. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Thank you so much for that context. Um, and I'm just really appreciating it, like you said, relating it to the recues and like I have more understanding of that and to hear that sort of parallel story um, woven throughout. Um, but yeah, so I'd be curious to hear, um, maybe we'll start with Lehua first, but um, so like what does like Hawaii mean to you and what does like the recues mean to you? Um, like what what do those words signify to you? Yeah, um, I think, you know, there's a lot of overlapping history between these two um, communities that we embody. And um, especially when you're looking at the histories of diaspora and the forces that kind of push our people one way or another across oceans, there's a lot of displacement um, that happens. There's a lot of assimilation that has happened. Um, for example, like in my family, and I know it's a, a lot of the same kind of sentiments for other families who are um, Shimanchu and, and mixed, it's, um, there's a lot of assimilation into Japanese culture and erasure of other histories. And um, yeah, I think it's just important that we not only acknowledge, but also embrace all the different parts that make us whole, because for a long time, I thought that you know, some of my my heritage didn't mix in with the rest like that I was raised with and it didn't make sense. Um, but I'm, you know, people like who are mixed and like me are evidence that it does make sense and it does work. And we have just as important of a history as anyone else. Um, so there's a lot of history of uh, assimilation, displacement, feeling like we should be one thing or feeling like we're not enough of another. Thank you. Yeah, Momi, I'm curious if you have resounding thoughts from that beautiful, um, yeah, statement. Yeah, yeah, definitely resonates with me too. So um, I would consider Hawaii and Rikyu both my homelands, um, but I've only ever been to Hawaii between the two. So um, my Baban, who's actually my mom's maternal grandma, uh, left Okinawa in 1911, and no one in my direct lineage has been back to that place, to the land, um, since 1911. Been over 100 years, four generations of um, a physical distance. Yeah. And so what does that mean to have a ancestral or spiritual connection to a place that you're not able to to physically access and to have a like ongoing um, daily relationship with um, as opposed to Hawaii um, I was born and raised on Kauai and that's where my dad's family is from from time immemorial so I was able to have that daily lived connection um, so I think that you know brings up a lot of questions about diaspora and connection to land you know there's a lot of I think awareness more so now than in the past I think about land back and the importance of Aina and land connection to indigenous people and and what that means to us you know Mm -hmm. um and an interesting connection that I've noticed is that um you know, I've done a lot of demographic work with our Laohui, our Native Hawaiian community. Um, and we haven't gotten the full results back, but it was projected that the 2020 census would show us that there were more Native Hawaiians in diaspora um, in North America than in Hawaii for the first time that we have recorded. Um, and so that really kind of shifts our understanding of what it means to be Hawaiian in the diaspora. Um, and how we how we continue to build and cultivate community in different and new ways to 
to maintain that connection um, mm -hmm. while we are maybe physically in different places. Um, I think that's an interesting connection because my understanding is that there may be for a while now as many Shimanchu outside of Rikyu um, mm -hmm. as there are physically in our homeland. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it's an interesting um, perspective of what it means to be connected to our land. Absolutely. Yeah, I love everything that you just said now. Um, and I'm so curious too, like I could not find that statistic um, for Okinawa or like, you know, how many Shimanchu are actually Shimanchu and living in Okinawa versus like there are like statistics outside um, and even how many are in Japan. Um, but that other, the other number about like how many of our o Okinawa and Urshimanchu people are actually living on the land that is their home. <laughs> um, so it's a really interesting parallel. Um, yeah. yeah, I think there's there's a connection to be made there with what you're saying, Mariko, with what Levo Urkea recently said about assimilation and identity. So mm -hmm. what language is even available to us to identify ourselves so that this information can be collected and understood? Mm -hmm. um, so for example, um, in Hawaii, it wasn't until recently that you could put Okinawan on a birth certificate or an identifier for you know, the state government oh. to collect that information. So, for example, my mother's and grandmother's birth certificates all say Japanese, even though personally we have identified as Okinawan since leaving Okinawa. Um, there's that, you know, kind of cognitive dissonance of who we know ourselves to be mm. and who we may be um, documented as from the perspective of, you know, the state government. Um, mm. And yeah, that has a lot to do with occupying governments too, which is another connection and, and shared experience of Kanaka and Shimanshu is um, who's collecting that data? What language do they allow us to use to identify ourselves and what do they recognize and then uh, document to share with others? Wow. Well, I had no idea that they, I mean, that makes a lot of sense because like looking at my grandpa's like, papers on arrival it said Japanese but I kind of just ignored that I was like oh no he's okay now and like knowing but understanding how that small piece of um change in the language really is yeah. a detriment to to a lot of things right but um I'm really excited just after listening to the answers of this first question because we're gonna go deep deeper into a lot of um a lot of what you both have talked about but um can you both kind of explain the work that you do? I think both of you have a little different backgrounds, which is really cool and uh, very different, unique perspectives on this. Um, and what inspires you for with the work that you do? And um, I think we'll start with Lehua for this one. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I guess like put it simply, like I'm an interdisciplinary artist and a kappa maker. And for those who might not be familiar, um, Kappa is a traditional bark cloth that um, is made all throughout parts of the Pacific and even parts of Africa and Indonesia um, and Asia. And But in Hawaii, we call it kappa and it was used for clothing, for bedding, for ceremonial purposes. And um, through colonization, it was nearly wiped out. And so... Back in the 70s and 80s, a dedicated group of practitioners um, took it upon themselves to look at the documentations, mostly written by white men, um, and surviving samples of kappa to kind of bring it back into practice. And so um, that's without their work, I wouldn't be able to, to do the work that I do today. And so I'm part of the next generation of younger kappa makers who have dedicated their work and their lives to bring this back into common everyday homes like it used to be. Um, and so that's what I primarily base most of my art practice off of, but I also do other um, mediums, painting, installation, um, and I show in galleries and museums and also make work for our lahui make um, clothing pieces or things that our people would have needed before colonization um, because I want it to be used. I want it to not just hang on a wall and look pretty. I want our people to be able to have access to this material again. Um, so that's really important to me and it's something that I'm working more towards every day. But um, 
yeah, I guess beyond that, I'll pass it to Mommy. So in terms of my work, um, my formal education is in economics, so specifically macroeconomics and statistics. Um, I went to college during the Great Recession, and so I was just <laughs> interested in understanding um, money and finance kind of as a foreign language, right? I think when you grew up as an indigenous person in a <laughs> Western capitalist society, there's a lot of dissonance there. And so I approached it not so much in order to, to participate and assimilate, but to, to understand um, mm. and to see, you know, what I could take and leave. Um, upon graduating from college, the first job that I got was with my alma mater, Kamehameha. And so really getting into education, which is what I do now, I teach economics. Um, that path was for the purpose of being able to come back home to Hawaii and to be able to serve my home community. Um, and so education was the way that I was able to do that. Um, and then in my community or personal work, uh, I have a passion for family history and genealogy. That is inspired by the practice of, of genealogy that you know, we're able to do here in Hawaii that's really emphasized and encouraged um, in Hawaii and in our Hawaiian culture. And so drawing from that, I'm able to apply that um, value and perspective to family history and genealogy for my other heritages as well. So I'm very interested and passionate about um, how we access family history and genealogical resources in diaspora and specifically across um, language differences. So for example, English speakers or Portuguese or Spanish speakers in diaspora mm -hmm. um, being able to access um, information and understanding about family and land in Okinawa. Awesome. I just wanted to follow up with what Lehua was talking about in terms of their artwork. I was uh, fortunate to see one of the, a few of their pieces at the Portland Art Museum um, earlier this year. And I think it was so cool to see uh, also surrounded by other Native artists. And it was just really cool to see in this like formal um, institute, which is, you know, not normally where you see it. And so I think it was just so cool and so beautifully hung. Um, I'm not too sure. I'm sorry, I forgot the name of your piece, but it was hanging from the ceiling and it was just so draped beautifully. And um, I think it's really awesome to see art in this way too, as a form of resistance to colonization as well. And it does it speaks in a different way in terms of like, you know, what words and stuff cannot do and stuff. So um, I was, uh, I really appreciated seeing that in person and um, that I just wanted to make a side note of that. And um, it's really cool to see. So, and I'm hoping to see more, more of your art in, in person in the future. Uh, mahalo. Yeah, that was actually kind of like a, such a weird full circle moment, actually, like, because that was the first art museum I'd ever been to when I was 17, I think it was, almost wow. 18. Mm -hmm. So I'd never been to like a formal art museum until then. Um, and that was only like, I want to say maybe eight years. Math, I'm like not going to do the mental <laughs> math right <laughs> now. <but> like, <laughs> like that was less than 10 years prior to the opening, opening of the exhibition at the art museum. And so you know, it's, it was like kind of emotional for me too, because, um, our people are usually so widely misrepresented, mm -hmm. um, in spaces like that, um, or not represented at all. And there's a huge, um, native Hawaiian and mixed native Hawaiian, um, community in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and the hello that I, danced with when I was living in Portland um they were like I mean they still are like some of my biggest supporters mm -hmm. um and my kumuhula who's also from Hilo side where I'm from um she brought all the kids and like all of our mm -hmm. little pio to the show and all my other things and it was just you know what she was telling me is just it's so um special and meaningful to see younger people like myself serving our even younger generations mm, yeah. um so that they have something to see themselves in so that they see themselves 
represented in a positive way and see themselves included in the story. Whereas, you know, institutions like big art organizations and museums probably wouldn't have otherwise, you know, any other native Hawaiian artists in their collection. Yeah. Um, and just to encourage these keiki to be who they are and to do what it is they want um, to represent. There's so many different ways to represent our people and represent all your different stories. And I think that if I had had someone like, you know, that when I was growing, growing up, I would have been um, a lot more sure and confident in myself and proud of all the different lineages that trickle down into making me who I am today. Uh, that's that's so beautiful. And I'm so glad um, you're able to celebrate that with your community because, yeah, that's a huge achievement, like talking about institutions like like art museums, because before it used to be like a display of like these exotic things and stuff like that. And for you to be able to change the context of how you're being presented is is so powerful. And, you know, people in these institutes, people who visit it are usually, you know, um, very privileged and have like there it's a certain demographic and so changing also that narrative I think is is super cool to see yeah I loved hearing the full circle um at like too like that it was like one of the first like museums that you went to and then you were able to it like put like be part of something there and um also hearing sort of generationally too that like you you hadn't seen it before but you were one of those people and then you're inspiring this younger generation and so um I'm feeling like I got chicken skin when you were talking and I was like oh my gosh like it is so hard when it feels like we're like a young like our our group our age group is younger and we are finding ourselves having to stand up in these really like mixed areas where it's really unclear and we're trying to stumble stumble our way through and like do it in integrity as much as we can and there's like minefields everywhere <laughs> um <laughs> trying to like okay is this the right thing to do is this the right thing to say um and then also be like you know mentors for this like upcoming group and then also preserve like you know what what was being erased um so anyhow that's, i think that's kind of an interesting segue into our next question is basically as mixed shimanchu um you kanaka maoli nihonjin um or oivi pene shimanchu um what parallels do you see in the rikyu and in hawaii history um, and like, how do you navigate those intersections? Cause like, like we said, it's like, it's a minefield and it's complicated. Um, but yeah, why don't we start with you, Mommy? All right. So, um, some highlights of connections that we might be able to make, uh, we have archipelagos, right? We have an indigenous culture, a lot of, um, diversity in language and practices, uh, a lot of biodiversity, uh, and then we have a period of colonialism and imperialism. So the timelines are very similar. I think 1879 is often the most uh, referred to date of, you know, Japan's occupation of Rikyu. Um, 1893 is a key date for Hawaii in terms of the, you know, illegal overthrow of the Hawaiian monarchy, the deposition of the monarch, Queen Lili Okolani. Um, so that's a really, really close timeline, right? Like you're thinking the late 1800s, um, thousands of years of trade and prosperity and, you know, just like harmonious existence. Um, and both of them being very uh, connected, interconnected with the communities and spaces around them, right? So Rikyu known for being a port of open trade, mm -hmm. um, which is not the case, right, necessarily for Japan. Um, and then Hawaii having a really long history of navigation, right, and travel. So even though we might be more uh, physically isolated, definitely interacting with um, trading, being influenced by the places around us. Um, and then we have a period of occupation. So for Rikyu by Japan, for Hawaii by the United States, um, through the late 1800s into the 1900s. Um, another connection I would say is I think for both places, the World War II 
experience is a very key experience for both places um, in terms of what was endured and then the response to that in terms of cultural revitalization. Um, so a lot of loss, a lot of trauma and negative effects endured um, through the war. Um, yeah, and then how do we respond to that, right? So we have that, you know, period of U.S. occupation of Rikyu, uh, continued U.S. occupation of Hawaii. <laughs> um, so they kind of intersect, they have parallels and then they have intersections and overlaps at certain periods of time, right? Both being really deeply affected by military buildup of the U.S. military in both places. Um, and then diaspora, right, as a kind of response to that. Um, and then a key change transition, you know, I don't know what word we want to use for 1972, but we all know that 1972 is, uh, I don't have a word that I think, you know, is, resonates with me and feels, feels okay with me. So we have 1972 as a key turning point for Rikyu. And then we have uh, the Hawaiian Renaissance also in the 1970s for Hawaii. Mm. Um, and so that is a period of time where we have a lot more uh, cultural revitalization um, practices like the Ho'oke's practice of kapa making, right, being one of uh, the many traditional practices reclaimed, um, being brought to the forefront and, and uplifted more um, from that period forward. Um, and then also language revitalization, right? Mm. So as a part of occupation and assimilation, language being um, denied, denigrated, punished for being used, um, and then how do we reclaim that generations later? Um, mm. Yeah, so from really the 70s to early 80s for Hawaii, um, deeply uh, inspired and informed by the language revitalization process of Aotearoa, um, and then adapted for Hawaii called Ahapunana Leo. Um, yeah, and then similarly, uh, a language reclamation process for Thank you um, with Uchinaguchi, Shimokutba um, to today. Ooh, I think you did that. I'm like, you just like gave like a brief <laughs> his timeline is for the book. Brief history. Like, yeah. Did you get yeah. all of that? Uh, yeah, and no, then, okay. Oh, and then now both of them still occupied. So we'll, we'll right. say that too, right? Yeah, so I know. I where are we now in place and time? Like the, the PFOS, PFOS, Red Hill, like all the, yeah. yeah. Anyway, it's yeah. like a separate podcast episode. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but yeah, I would love to hear from like, so we just talked timeline a little bit, but another component was sort of like the identity as well, of, like sort of being mixed. Um, but I'd love to turn it over to Lehua if you'd like to share anything on either identity or um, timeline or similarities um, between the two. Yeah, I think um, Momi just gave like a beautifully concise, wonderful, eloquent timeline that kind of wrapped up so much in one. But, you know, just on the thought of like identity and assimilation, I mean, so much of our identity is informed um, by being diasporic and, um, you know, being island nations uh, in the Pacific, our histories often revolve around military occupation and our identities are informed by that as well, you know? And so I think just, you know, speaking on my personal experience and from what I've heard from um, other people with similar shared backgrounds is that our assimilation has become um, so fused with who we are, like code switching, like we were talking about before mm -hmm. we started um, recording in the podcast, code switching, depending on who we're talking to and using different language to describe ourselves and each other, depending on who our audience is. And um, when Erica was also talking about how they recalled that their um, family's birth certificates up to a certain point all said Japanese when even though they were truly not. Um, and that's how it is in my family as well. And it's just still not something that we talk too much about. There's a lot of shame and stigma around um, being Shimanchu versus Japanese. And, you know, you talk to my grandma and she's so proud to like know a little bit of Japanese words and like just share that culture with me. And, you know, it's 
in some ways it kind of blurs the line between who we are and and maybe it's something entirely new rather than one thing or another um and I think that's something kind of beautiful about being so complex complicated like situated at these all these different overlapping intersections um but it's something that's not easy to navigate either and I think the more that we have conversations like these with people with um similar shared experiences and heritage and background um we might be able to articulate it a little bit better because you know our parents our grandparents their grandparents didn't have necessarily the tools or the the realization that these are things that we do need to talk about and um the trauma of erased identity and cultural displacement is very real Mm. um and so yeah I think it's something that we need to deal with in both places in both cultures um rather than see them as as different you know see and it's not just um Shimanchu and Hawaiian it's it's bigger than that it's not just seeing the divides but rather seeing the the connections and overlapping histories and even parallel histories um that actually make it easier for us to relate rather than harder Mm. some things i want to draw attention to um, that lehua has brought up um one major connection i see is the ongoing reclamation that i think most indigenous people have to do about um you know what parts of our traditions do we want to preserve in the traditional form and which ones do we want to maybe adapt or Mm -hmm. add to what does it mean to be an indigenous person today Mm -hmm. you know in our in our current space and time Um, so for example Lehua was talking earlier about you know what does it mean to make kapla that people can use you know and so if the the purpose or focus is the usefulness and the the personal relationship and an everyday basis with, you know, the things that we are creating. Um, what does that look like and how is that similar and different from how it may have been done before? Um, I think a interesting connection is with the Hajiji practice that I think mm. has been, you know, really uh, wonderfully reclaimed and, and valued more recently. Yeah. Um, and there has been a lot of conversation I've seen among Hajichia about um, what patterns do we want mm-hmm. to um, replicate exactly? Do we want to preserve in their traditional form? And in what ways do we want to adapt the practice, keeping the same spirit or purpose, um, but now applying it to our needs and goals of life today um and so that's that's super interesting right is how how do we be an indigenous person in a modern world (laughs) when we are so informed by the pressures of assimilation um when we have to reckon with a history of um Mm -hmm. occupation right and have to you know deal with that we cannot there's no perfect world in which we can separate that um so yeah, our lineages, even when we are connected to our families or to our place, both of those are constantly um, under the pressure of assimilation and occupation. Mm-hmm. Um, specifically, one thing that brings to mind is the idea of diaspora and connection to land. So what I think is common in Japanese and Shimanchu community is we'll say what generation we are from leaving mm-hmm. the homeland. Mm -hmm. We even have this terminology that's very commonly used and emphasized about ise, nise, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. I'm yonsei. That's a Japanese term that Mm -hmm. inevitably is informed by Japanese worldview and perspective. Um, So to what extent do we want to continue to use that? And to what extent is that not resonant with who we are as Shimanchu, mm. uh, right? I interestingly, I don't really see the same type of perspective used um, for Hawaiians in diaspora about how many years has it been since you left, or how many generations has it been since somebody was born in Hawaii. There is complexity there, but it's just interesting about what is emphasized and focused on. Yeah. Mm. Um, and the last thing I'll say about that too is that you know being a mixed Kanaka and Shimanchu person is 
the, the sides of my family <laughs> perspectives on being mixed are very different. Most mm-hmm. Kanaka I know are mixed, at least culturally, have a mixed cultural identity, maybe claim a mixed ethnic identity. And so the perspective on being multiracial, multi-ethnic, multicultural, um, I think is very common in Hawaii. It does have its own challenges, but the prevalence is to me uh, a benefit, right? To be in community and say, most of us are mixed, being mixed is okay. Mm -hmm. Um, I think there are challenges and limitations in the Shimanchu community about what does it mean to be Shimanchu if you are mixed. So for example, my mom is mixed, so I'm actually a second generation to be a mixed Shimanchu in my family. My mom's mom is Shimanchu. My mom's dad is white. My grandma did not have any of her family at their wedding, and my grandma's family did not speak to her for years after they got married mm. because she did not, not only she married a white man, but she married a, a non Shimanchu. Um, and so that was a sticking point um, in my family. And I think, you know, there are connected and maybe similar experiences in other families. How does that inform who we are um, as Mikshimanchu to have that cultural or familial response to who we are as being mixed? Mm. Damn, so much things that my head, my gears are turning just... (laughs) I'm going to have to like think about this after after this conversation like the generational thing is such an interesting thing that you bring up because yeah that's definitely a Japanese type of thing and I don't know if like I personally use that marker of the separation from the homeland to to Hawaii for me um anyways I'm like just thinking right now out loud so I'm just gonna stop <laughs> no I love it yeah, I just I want to like my my mom went through a similar thing. Like, you know, my dad is white and she's like, so I'm Nisei, second generation, whatever you want to call that. But the complexities and I've talked to like so many people, really fascinating conversations that like are generative in themselves, but they don't produce any like clear results or anything. But having the conversation is totally worthwhile. Like it, there is benefit to having that conversation um, and it makes you feel a little less alone. And I think that speaks to what you were saying Mommy, about like being mixed isn't a bad thing like it adds dimension but like there are these like places in our lineages they're like oh that's a tension point like oh that's complicated that like it got a little more complicated then um and like it's informing how we are moving in the world today and something that who i was saying was just like reminding me of um it was like about privilege like the privilege the gift that we have now it's complicated but it's like a privilege that we are able to do this work for like to be a good ancestor to be like leaders in our own way and shifting our culture and like what an exciting time to be able to be helping um to move that conversation forward whatever way it goes to be at the table and I've been thinking about this a lot of like all right, like, so is there a seat for me at this table? And like, do I want to sit at this table? And if I do, like, how much do I want to eat? Like, like, where, where is this going? Um, and anyway, I'm just feeling very excited and inspired by everything that you've, you've said. And I love talking identity and compli- like, just, it's complicated to be a human in this time. It, it is regardless, but hearing your stories about, um, yeah, the, just the way that you are um, mixed, um, yeah, it just like adds dimension and depth. Um, and I think compassion, um, the more we share stories, like we can empathize with one another and be like, oh, I didn't know it was like that. And um, I like, I'm sorry, I know we need to move the conversation forward. But one thing that I keep finding myself saying about Okinawa is like, when people don't know what Okinawa is, I say, oh, it's like Hawaii of Japan. Um, and I was wondering if you two had thoughts on Okinawa being described that way. Um, Because again, there are parallels like to the two, but then I'm like, "Mm, there's some, like, there's some issues there um, that I don't know how to unpack, but I'd love to hear if either of you have thoughts. And if you don't, we can totally move on to the next question. (laughs) Mm, I have a lot of feelings. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I mean, just, I guess to put it simply is like, it oversimplifies who 
the native people and communities of those two very separate places are um i think it's a way to flatten our cultures um and it also erases the possibility of those two different cultures intermingling in individuals like all of us here in this conversation um and just as someone who was raised mostly Hawaiian, you know, I also went to Kamehameha and that's the kind of values that I was raised with for the most part. Um, it's just always weird when someone's like, oh, it's like the Hawaii of this one place or like it's exotic, tropical, whatever, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of just another way to further these stigmas that are rooted in colonization and a foreign gaze upon native peoples mm. and um yeah there's I guess so much more I could say about it but that's kind of I, yeah it, it doesn't feel rooted in something that's well-intentioned I guess I would add to that but it's it's interesting that an explanation or a parallel is necessary, right? So that indicates to you, I think, the centering or privileging of an American perspective, right? Because in order to try to relate to someone that Okinawa is to Japan, what Hawaii is to the United States, mm -hmm. really focuses on the United States, right? <laughs> um, I think that also brings up important points about history and about the accuracy of the information that people have access to, right? So we have a, a long history of, um, you know, the, the colonizer gets to write whatever they want. And in the case of Japan and Okinawa is uh, also unwrite whatever they want, right? Like mm -hmm. to the extent of literally removing from history books uh, things that undeniably occurred. Um, but in order to try to minimize them or to not be accountable, we're just going to remove them from the record, right? And not allow people to, to know, right? Um, yeah. Related to that, I want to connect that to what Mariko was just talking about in terms of being mixed is that because of the U.S.'s continued occupation in Okinawa, there is a inextricable link between being mixed as a Shimanju person and a connection to U.S. military, mm -hmm. right? So when I tell people that my Shimanju grandma married a white man from America, the assumption is that he was military and she was on Okinawa at the time because that is a very common experience or belief of how that would come to pass. For my family, it happens not to be true, but the fact that there is that assumption indicates to us the prevalence of U.S. military occupation and the implications that that has on Hawaii as a community and as Okinawa and Okinawans as a community, right? And so it's interesting to consider the extent to which mixed identity is centered around whiteness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the U.S., the idea of being mixed is in relation and proximity to whiteness, in accessibility to whiteness through heritage, right? Um, and so what does that mean when, when we say somebody is mixed and they're not at all white? Mm -hmm. Like, do we mm -hmm. consider that, right? Mm -hmm. Do we consider mm -hmm. that it's not about proximity to whiteness, that it could be what we've been talking about in terms of intersectionality, of layered experiences, um, of multiple perspectives as opposed to approaching a center of whiteness, right? Going from marginality to center as some kind of goal. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily the goal, right? Um, and then that also connects to our earlier conversation about using generations to describe our distance or proximity to homeland. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I actually talked to some um, people who are really focused on revitalizing Uchinaguchi or Shimokutuba um, and asked them about what words are there in Shimokutuba for multiracial people? Mm. And to what extent do we need to have that language 
right? Because if we're talking about pre-colonialism um, is being of multiple ethnicities or different heritages, a key identifying factor that needs to be named? Do we need a word for it? Mm -hmm. To what extent does colonialism and imperialism force us to name these things and kind of force the priority of, now this is important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How many years it's been since your family had to leave because of colonialism? That's going to be one of the number one identifiers that you will put forth. And how does that affect how we connect to other Shimanchu? Right? If one of the first things you see on somebody's IG bio is whether they're Ise, Nise, Sanse, Yonse, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Does that serve to connect us and build the community that we want? Um, and there's this balance of specificity versus unnecessary isolation or disconnection. Mm. It makes me think a lot about like when someone asks you like, oh, you're Hawaiian, how much? Oh. Or, you know, like percentages. And um, you see this a lot with indigenous peoples up here on the continent as well. Like um, the whole issue of blood quantum is rooted in co colonialization and um, the whole idea of trying to erase native peoples not only from their culture but from their communities and from any claims to their ancestral homelands at all um and that's one of the reasons why blood quantum was not written as a requirement into uh the original homestead act hawaiian homestead act mm -hmm. and um yeah it's like what what does yon just the same thing as like yon say me say what does those identifiers like blood quantum have to serve in in the ways of connecting us you know what what purpose does that have I don't I think it's just another way of um, qualifying us in terms of colonizer labels um, putting us into boxes that are easy to group us um, and yeah it's it's definitely more divisive than inclusive I think um, because they're rooted in structures of power mm. um, that seek to erase. Wow, yeah. Okay, so kind of continuing on this um, identity of like what it means to be mixed and stuff, I know the term hapa is used a lot in terms of um, as a term for labeling mixed identities, but I feel like it's generally used as it. I feel like there is a misunderstanding of what the term hapa is. And um, I feel like there's a lot of, not debate, but a lot of, I've seen a lot of conversation about it. And um, I was hoping what, uh, asking what's your opinion, both Momi and Lehua, of, of what the term hapa means to you and the way it's being used today and how I think it has been being misused out of, uh, context now I feel like there there's a, like a lot of conversation around that but I'm curious what both of you have to say about that um yeah you know I think the root of the word it's a word in Olalo Hawaii like it literally means like half like you know two parts um like Hapalua describing the moon when it's like just mm -hmm. a half wedge um and lately in the last several years at the very least i've whenever i, I hear someone using the word hapa it's rarely been someone who is of native hawaiian ancestry and something else just two things half half um it's almost always been someone who's not of any hawaiian ancestry describing how they're maybe like half Chinese and half something else, or they have a little bit of Hawaiian and then a bunch of other things and just one parent that's part Hawaiian. Um, and I think it's, it's become a little appropriated to say the least um, in a lot of ways, similar to how um, some people who are not of native indigenous heritage to this continent are starting to sort of 
hijack the conversation of being what it is to be two spirit, which in um, many native cultures up here on the continent is a word for people who do not subscribe to the gender binary or describe themselves as queer, um, but two spirit being an embodiment of both um, feminine and masculine traits similar to mahu. And so I think in some ways, terms like those that are culture specific, rooted in a specific community and heritage and entire worldview and perspective are being completely appropriated and misapplied to people that use those terms because it's convenient. Mm. Um, it's a way to maybe stay relevant in some sort of mm. context um, without actually understanding the root of where those things comes come from. And um, oftentimes those really complex and painful histories that gave rise to those words in the first place. I'll echo what Liv Wilkia is saying in that hapa is a Hawaiian word used by Hawaiians to describe Hawaiians. Um, and so historically, it might have another identifier right after it. So hapa and an ancestry that you have in addition to being Hawaiian. So you are Hawaiian. That is assumed. That is implied by the use of the term hapa is you are a Hawaiian person. And now you're going to specify in addition to being Hawaiian, you know, what other cultural or ethnic heritage you have. Hapa kepani, right? For example, so to be part or mixed Japanese. Going back to what I said earlier, so why, why is there an emphasis on needing to specify or even worse, quantify your heritage right, under colonialism? <laughs> yeah, like do we have these words prior to colonialism? Because we know we have trade, navigation, interactions with places other than one's birthplace, was it necessary or emphasized to be specified that you were mixed prior to that? I don't know. Or is that, you know, specifically colonial? With regard to Hawaii, because of the U.S.'s occupation of Hawaii and the treatment of Hawaiians as indigenous to so-called United States, um, there are a lot of legal and political motivations for the way that the United States views Hawaii and Hawaiians. Um, so it, more specifically, I would encourage anyone who is interested to look at the work of Kehaulani Kowanui, who wrote Hawaiian Blood, that talks a lot about um, multiracial, multiethnic um, Hawaiian experience and specifically the blood quantum uh, policies that affect our community. Um, Dr. Marla Arvin, who also does a lot of mixed race studies um, and is Native Hawaiian, both Native Hawaiian um, people, right? So writing from a Native Hawaiian perspective. Also interestingly found the Instagram called Reclaiming Hapa that was specifically about um, bringing, you know, kind of more social media level awareness of mixed Hawaiian identity and the uh, contextualized rather than decontextualized use of the term hapa. So I think at best it's decontextualized and at worst it is full-on cultural appropriation. Um, and I have a lot of compassion as a mixed person, right? You're mixed and we know that may be uh, important to us to have an identifier that other people understand. And I think this is an opportunity for non-Hawaiian Shimanchu to be able to reconnect and reclaim Uchinaguchi, Shimokotoba, and what ways can we stay rooted in our own respective worldviews to describe our own experiences? Mm. And if a word in Shimokotoba does not exist yet, can we create it? Can we use our Shimanchu perspective to create what we are trying to describe? Because mm. Hapa ain't it. Hapa is a Hawaiian experience. Mm. Right. And so that is not only appropriate, it is going to be inaccurate. Mm -hmm. that, that cannot ever be used to describe <laughs> an experience that we've not lived, right? If you are a non Hawaiian, she went through. Mm -hmm. I'm just like loving and resonating and like kind of like 
sponging all of that in. Um, and it just like makes me think of like, you know, like the, the migration of words or like, how do things become appropriated? How do we let, not, we let these things, like how do things get taken away and how are we informed and like, how are we claiming things? And, um, I kind of want to take this to the next question, which is around family. Um, and like, I'm just thinking of like the way that we learn our words or like the way that certain things are, um, like the, the environment is provided to us to be able to claim these things. Um, and so, you know, without somebody educating us or like hearing that, okay, after Hapa will come this other identifier, like to have that be sort of normal, like um, without that, it has the opportunity to get lost. Um, and so I'm curious, um, so because our identity is sort of for first formed through our family or whatever environment we're in, um, if we don't have a strong connection, like how are we able to create these communities outside of our family? Um, so like, I know, um, Momi, you were talking a little bit earlier about um, like a family being a very strong bond and then like through like the generations away from home and does that impact it? Um, but yeah, I'm curious to hear um, from both of you um, what family means um, in this context of identity um, and yeah and how do we seek um, as diasporic people connection perhaps beyond family as we are adapting to like the modern day um, so it's like kind of looking back and and forward at the same time um, actually I'd love to hear from you Lehua if you have any thoughts on on this yeah I guess on the topic of like family and and community has chosen family, um, you know, like for myself in the last seven to eight years, I've been mostly on my, um, my own ever since I was like 17, 18 and up until now. And so my mostly on my own being that meaning that like I've been on, here up on the continent by myself, um, my family being back home in Hawaii and, um, you know, it's not easy, but I think, for me, what was kind of the turning point, not only for myself as like an individual, but also in my art practice, which is inherently rooted in cultural Hawaiian practices, is that um, I was able to find my family through my hula, dancing hula up here on the continent and my kumu hula. As soon as I found out that she was also from Big Island, I was like, okay, yeah, this is the one. Um, these are my people. I need, this is where I need to be. And there was a lot of um, reconciling with all the things that I had kind of chosen to forgotten or forget and, and let go by the wayside and a reconciling with all those parts of myself that had started to get a little bit lost and in becoming part of that hello and by as a byproduct of that joining a whole different community that I had thought didn't even exist here in the Northwest. Um, all of that led to me finding out more about myself and what I can contribute and how I can fit into the whole. And that just, you know, changed so much for me. And it gave me like a whole new purpose, a whole new perspective on what it means to be mixed and furthermore part of a diaspora that is mixed. Um, and some of these people in my community hadn't even been to their ancestral homelands as native Hawaiian people. Um, and so doing what I can to be someone who had roots in both places um, and roots in many other places, but just roots, you know, lived experiences in two different um, spots in the world across the Pacific. Um, it was really a game changer for me. And so I think, you know, family is not just cultural and heritage side of things, but also like who you choose as your people to reconnect with some of those parts that maybe blood family is not able to um, always compensate for. Well, thank you for sharing your reconnection story. I love that. It just like, it, it makes me smile really big that when we find each other, you know, it's like a coming home. Mumi, would you like to chime in? I'll turn it over yeah. to you. Yeah. What this is making me think about, like in terms of when I do family history and genealogy research, a lot of that, we all have different ways of connecting to ourselves and to our ancestors, right? And so to me, one of the ways I, I like to do it is I like to know like the stories, the life stories of, you know, of people, what did they experience? What was important to them? So I think that we can have 
compassion and understanding for our ancestors and then therefore for ourselves, right? Because to a certain extent, like, you know, they are the pieces that we are made out of. Um, and so there, there isn't a, a way to completely separate ourselves from them. And how can we love and honor them without having to be just like them? Mm-hmm. Because part of my understanding of my ancestors is that not only did they have a different experience, but many of their experiences may have been unwanted or involuntary. Mm-hmm. You know, like if it weren't for colonialism, would they have wanted to leave their homelands? You know, we don't know. What, what, what would being Shimanchu feel like today if we didn't lose a third to a half of our community mm-hmm. yeah. in the Battle of Okinawa? What, what would that look like? We don't know, right? And so I think it's a balance for me of understanding them and therefore being able to have deeper compassion for them and then making a choice about what parts of them we want to be similar to and what parts we want to learn from and do differently. And I'll take that a step further and say, I like to imagine with the choices that we have today, what would they want for us? I don't think it's necessary or accurate at all times to say that they would want us to be just like them at all times. Because if many of their choices were necessities in response to an unwanted circumstance, that's what they had to do. Would they have done things differently if they had other options? Perhaps. And I think that is, to me, a really generative and helpful perspective to have, um, to say that it is okay for us to do things differently mm-hmm. and love and honor and respect them. Yeah. Right. And actually, that may be our way to love and honor and respect them, to say, hey, grandma, I have different choices than you had in your lifetime. Mm-hmm. And I think you would want me to choose what's best for me in this circumstance. And I carry you with me and I carry that guidance to do a different thing than you were able to do. Right. That might be cool. That could be a way of like uplifting them. Hey, you didn't have this choice and I do. Yeah. And with that, you know, I think one of the realities I experience in diaspora is that when you do not have a full and complex community around you in your homeland to connect to that can get really narrowed and perhaps limited to whatever family you migrate with. Mm -hmm. So when we have stories of migration, you know, that takes an entire community, entire village or Island of people who know you care about you and can support you and meet different needs for you to all of your familial and community needs having to be met by a few people. Right. And therefore limiting the experience that you would have had a breadth of experience and knowledge to draw from Mm -hmm. in your home community when it's now a nuclear family, which is not traditional to many of us. I want to have compassion for those people not being able to meet all the needs that a community previously met. Right. As individuals trying to survive in diaspora. I'll add to that a level of being in diaspora and perhaps being a mixed person. You may only have one person in your family who you're now relying on to be the connection to your entire culture and lineage and history. And they, like any human, have their limitations. (laughs) They can only be who they are, right? So I think, you know, it's very interesting of how we create identity and community now is like, what does it mean to be Okinawan? And what is just my mom? Yeah, you know, is is this an Okinawan thing or is this a Carol thing? Because <laughs> you don't know, right? And and I, you know, in terms of our humanity and and keeping our sense of self, like it's important for us to be able to be ourselves. And you know, and Carol can be Carol, and part of it is because she's Shimanchu, and part of it is just her that she would have always been. <laughs> Oh my God. Right? And that's what, what would have made a thriving community is that collection of individualities, right? That each mm-hmm. person would be able to contribute their special knowledge and gifts. Um, yeah. And so, you know, how do we, how do we try to recreate that effect in diaspora communities? Um, I think that Erica Shimanchu Pen Pals is Mm. One example that I will always shout from the hilltops about um, in terms of (laughs) connecting us beyond our families of origin, right? We have them. They are wonderful. Um, We do not have to limit ourselves just 
to one way of connecting, right? Mm -hmm. So in addition to them, we can have other communities. Um, For me personally, that's the first time I made any queer or trans Shimanchu friends was through Shimanchu pen pals. I did not know how to conceive of being a Shimanchu person and queer trans before Shimanchu pen pals because there is no one in the in my family who migrated to Hawaii. There is no one who is LGBTQIA in my family. And if my identity as a Shimanchu hangs on my own nuclear or blood family that is going to vastly limit my ideas of what is possible. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I am now able to have 10 times more queer mm-hmm. and trans Shimanchu friends and community now um, than I would have otherwise been able to. So that's one example. What are other ways that we can build community um, today that is going to serve the Shimanchu community that we want to be? Mm-hmm. Mm. Right, like our history and our family help us to move forward. Mm-hmm. How do we use them to inform, like, what, who do we want to be? Where do we want to go from here? Thank you for saying all of that, Momi. I was getting like emotional, uh, tears were sp- shared <laughs> in a good way. What you're saying in terms of how do we take what our ancestors done and like change it for us in this modern context. It reminded me of our conversation we had, I think last year with uh, Bia in Brazil and she's a, um, oh, I'm forgetting the term. Uh, yeah, a Kaminchu, thank you. And mm-hmm. we were talking about Obon and she was explaining a uh, ceremony of Obon and stuff, but she was also saying how part of, being Okinawan or Shimanchu is our resilience and our ways in terms of adapting, in terms of like our tradition and turning it to serve the modern, or I guess our needs for today. And it's not necessarily taking away from what we know, but just, you know, changing it to serve our needs. And that's how we survive because we have to adapt. And that's what it kind of reminded me of. And I think that's really beautiful. (laughs) I started getting emotional again. Yeah, that Mana'o, that wisdom struck me too. And so I took a note when I was listening to it. And the way I have it written down is good Okinawans know when to give up tradition in order to survive. Yes, love it. Thank you for that. That's not ideal, right? But that is how we're here today, right? Is whatever strategies for survival that they had were necessary for us to have the opportunity to perpetuate our traditions. Mm. Right. It's so that we, that resilience. Yeah, I'm curious too. We've speak. We've been talking a lot from like the Shimanchu experience, and I just want to bring in the Kanaka or like um, voice as well. Um, and it's an area where I'm actually very curious because I don't have a whole lot of exposure. Speaking of people that are like isolated, and like my one connection to my Okinawan lineage is, is my mom. Um, you know that type of thing. I would love to hear. Um, um, if there are ways in which like the diasporic Hawaiian community um, is connecting with each other, like, I mean, like, I know the pen pals exist, but like, is there a way that um, folks are finding strength in the communities um, together? Um, and I know you spoke a little bit to this Lehua, um, about, you know, finding community and then sort of f- finding yourself revitalized in that. Um, but are there other ways in which that community is is strengthened or upheld or um, re- like, you know, finding that resilience? Yeah, um, for me, it's it's been, you know, like I mentioned, dancing hula again, and that kind of led a, to a domino effect of me reclaiming a lot of other parts of my culture that I grew up with, but didn't I think I took a bit of it for granted, you know, like having it all around all the time. You, you, you know, as a kid, you don't have the, the necessarily have the perspective of being appreciative of it and having that access until that's taken away from you largely involuntarily. Right. Um, and so for me, that led to dancing hula that led to um, speaking again, um, Kappa, of course, for me, 
and leading down to um, reclaiming certain spiritual practices and perspectives and just wanting to learn so much more so that I can share that with kids who were in my position that I was in 15 years ago um, when I didn't have any anyone else to turn to um, um, unless it was my own blood family, my father, who's the Hawaiian um, of my parents. And he never really grew up with much connection to it at all. He was more attached to his, um, you know, raised by my Japanese, Japanese grandma. And um, so like Momi was saying, there's limitations to, you know, that our, our families have. So I, you know, I sought those connection, connections and and resources elsewhere. Um, so it ended up being a lot of cultural stuff, but also just um, finding solidarity and kinship with other Indigenous peoples who might also be part of diasporic communities themselves, um, not growing up on the reservation or on their ancestral homelands, but growing up in urban um, communities which is a whole other conversation, but there's a lot of parallels to being native born, but born outside of your native lands and raised outside of your native lands. And um, we deal with a lot of similar issues of assimilation, code switching, limited or lack of access to our own cultural practices. Um, and then seeing the limitations that our, fa our own families have and um, the limited access that they had trying to connect. And so finding kinship with other native tribes here on the continent was really um, another source of home in a sense and, and uh, kind of encouragement on my journey and realizing that it's not just Hawaiians that feel this, it's not just Shimanchu, it's not just any one group, it's a lot of us are dealing with similar um, intergenerational traumas from being displaced and through sharing our stories it was really a point of um, coming together and becoming stronger and and realizing that um, you know I wasn't alone in any of this at all I'll add to that but something that's coming to mind when we talk about this is I don't know who has said this so I kind of attribute to them but there are as many ways to be Hawaiian as there are Hawaiians, right? And so I, I carry that with me in terms of like, there's not one way. And if there were an idea in our mind about what does it mean to be Hawaiian? What does it mean to be Shimanchu? Um, how that is like from probably from a colonial perspective, that's probably not even within our community trying to define for ourselves, so. So then it's not useful, right? <laughs> That's not, not even the point. Um, I will say that to me, the hard answer about building community is as indigenous people, access to land, right? Like it's a huge missing piece. And I feel that, I, I think I feel it distinctly as a native Hawaiian born and raised in Hawaii who has never been to Okinawa. Mm. Right. And so to me, there is a very stark difference that I feel in terms of I feel my ancestors with me. I'm proud to be Shimanchu. I know my connection, but I haven't felt it in my physical body. And there are certain things mm -hmm. that are just the missing piece, you know, that I don't think I can feel fully connected mm -hmm. without the land and ocean piece of it. Right. So I know from a Hawaiian perspective, um, both uh, Lehua and I went to Kamehameha. I, I won't say that institutions are necessarily like helpful or, or great, um, but a benefit of going to Kamehameha was that, you know, Kamehameha is, is a school for Native Hawaiians. You're going to school with 100 percent of your peers are Native Hawaiian. Right. And so to me, that helped me to see the diversity of how do people we, we all have being Hawaiian in common. And yet it was a very diverse population, mm -hmm. diverse interests, diverse ways of identifying ourselves within the Hawaii community. Um, and so that helped me to feel a lot more comfortable of, hey, number one, my connection to being Hawaiian is not just my dad. Like I said, is it a, is it a my mom thing or a Shimanju thing? I don't know. Is it a Hawaiian thing or my dad thing? I didn't know. 
because <laughs> he was, was my main yeah. connector, right? Um, and we each have our own individual ways of doing culture and doing life. Um, and they are informed by their needs, mm-hmm. right? So we went to Kamehameha, my family went to Kamehameha for educational opportunities. It was a side effect, a fringe benefit for me that I developed a sense of Hawaiian identity through going to that school. My parents' mean hope for me in sending me to Kamehameha was to get me off of a rural neighbor island mm. in order to access better educational opportunities, in order to access better economic opportunities as an adult, to be able to survive in Hawaii, basically to get a good education, to get a good job, to make enough money to be able to live here. Mm. That was really the necessity behind it all. Yeah, so that is all to say, how do we build community now? Um, what do we want? Mm. You know, what, what bonds us, not just in terms of like the performative or outside stuff, but like in the shared hope that connects us. And I think part of that is ancestral. You know, we meet each other and we think right? Like there's an ancestral connection. Your ancestors probably knew my ancestors and like they wanted us to be able to connect again now. And so with that heart connection, like what, what do both of us and our ancestors in us want? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I think that that would be the main thrust for me of like where we go from here, right? As opposed to it's not the things, it's not the Mm-hmm. boxes that we can check right? right thank you for saying that I love um I have had the the pleasure and privilege of meeting many Shimanchu including Momi in person um and it, it like really is kind of transcendent when you meet somebody like across like it feels like you're bridging timelines or something like that where like knowing our ancestors probably had connection with each other and we're like finding each other again um anyway um so just tangent um gratitude for that that little plug and it was lovely to meet you and I love your shirt (laughs) these conversations have been really great and I'm really thankful for the both of you to be on this but we're gonna um move it to our last favorite question um what is your go-to karaoke song uh lehua maybe you can and let us know what to put on our our playlist <laughs> our karaoke playlist my answer is so shame I so like side note little background story real quick so my dad like that's his his thing like every <laughs> Wednesday night you know I mean it's probably a little different now because COVID but he was so devastated when he couldn't go singing every Wednesday once the bars shut down with oh. COVID and once I turned, you know, 21, he's like, okay, Adrian, he calls me by my English name. Okay, Adrian, like, it's time to go. Like, let's go singing. Yeah, like, let's go. <laughs> and he was trying so hard for years to, like, warm me up to this idea. And he only sings Frank Sinatra. And he used to oh, practice yeah. in his bedroom, like, all the time. <laughs> and so I I know way too much Frank Sinatra for oh a 26-year-old. <laughs> um, so... But I've never been because once I was that age and once um, we were in the same place, it was COVID times. And, um, you know, so and he's you know, on Oahu, so it was hard for us to connect and stuff. And so I literally have not done karaoke since I did like Britney Spears karaoke for my like eighth birthday party <laughs> when I was a kid. <laughs> so oh my goodness probably the last song I ever did was hit me baby one more time and I definitely don't want that to be (laughs) (laughs) so we're gonna let that live in the past but um if when I when I come back home and y'all want to get together Mm -hmm. yes please we can we can write that record (laughs) Is Frank Sinatra also going to be on this playlist? For do one? I mean, <laughs> it's it's in my blood, so I <laughs> it might show up. I cannot say. <laughs> I well, it. I I love the story, and I hope that you're able to you know get that karaoke session in with your dad because I'm sure he would like love it, and it'll be his core memory for like forever. <laughs> oh yeah, Garth is going to be very happy when that happens. <laughs> 
Oh my God. I love that. It's like a long time coming. It's like, you still haven't done it. Like what? That's crazy. It's crazy. Oh, <laughs> uh, um, Momi, I know you've uh, mentioned your favorite karaoke songs multiple times and they're all I'm Yeah. But, I'm going to add to it. Yeah. So. Please add. I was like, are, are there any new ones that you'd like to add? <laughs> yes. Because... Yes, there are. Okay. Okay. So we recently had a, a Shimanchi meetup in uh, Lenape land. So uh, New Jersey, um, Mariko was there, Mona, Mia, Yuki, and Megan. Um, and we did an impromptu karaoke sesh in a public park in daylight. <laughs> fully sober and so you can karaoke anywhere karaoke is in the heart it's in the soul um, and I also want to say I'm a firm believer in karaoke like if you're a good singer don't be because it's about <laughs> connecting people <laughs> like you know what I'm saying just it's it's for the feeling it's for the vibes um so the the vibe that I want to offer to everyone which was amazing when we had our meetup is Part of your world from the Little Mermaid. <laughs> yes. There are videos on Instagram. It was a turn up. Okay. There was choreography. Like, yeah. <laughs> if you haven't tried it, you should. And you should with your friends who will back you up and dance and sing back I up. I love you. it. An alternative, if you're too embarrassed to do it in public, car karaoke is also a very good one. I do that all the time. I have a mini mic in my car for that specific reason. I do cut solo karaoke sessions with myself, okay? It's a great stress relief. I'm just putting it out there for people who don't sing as well. That is me. So that's just a, a fun tip for everyone out there. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you. Oh man, that that concludes our episode. And this is, might be a little long one, but I really love these conversations. And there's like a lot more that we can talk about. Um, and I don't know. I hope hopefully we can have another have both of you on again because I after this I'm just like gonna be thinking about a lot of things that we're talking about. So I really appreciate this. But um, where can we um, we point people to find you on either like Instas, social medias? Um, Lehua, maybe we can start with you. You can find me on Instagram at uh, it's just my name Lehua Uokea, but in between two underscores, so underscore Lehua Uokea underscore, and then. Um, all of my art and documentation for my work is on my website, which is also just my name, .com, .com. But yeah, I just want to mahalo you and everyone else for this conversation and for sharing space and for some vulnerable, tender parts. And, you know, I think it's really special and very valuable for us to connect in this way. And um, yeah, someone who's, still kind of freshly reconnecting to my Shimachi side, which is highly frowned upon in my family for a long time. Um, yeah, I just appreciate you guys. And hopefully um, this podcast can be a, a helpful resource for anyone else who's trying to reconnect for themselves. Awesome. Thanks. And Mommy, where can um, our listeners find you again? My IG is at Kuule Momi, K U U L E I M O M I. It's my personal. So, yeah, expect personal. <laughs> but I would love to connect with people, especially if they're doing any history genealogy work and have any resources that I can help boost and share to others. And thank you to you all. Ahui ho, matayasai. Awesome. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much again, Momi and Idehua, for joining us. And until next time, we'll, we'll see you again. Mata yasai.
Wow, what an incredible and insightful conversation that just begins to explore the Okinawan Kanaka Maoli experience. Like many others, my Okinawan family were settlers in Hawaii, so I'm constantly learning and decolonizing my own understanding of Kanaka Shimatsu allyship, and I'm very grateful to have these two brilliant Kanaka Shimatsu share their stories and experiences with us today. What about you? What was your experience like listening to the conversation? We would love to hear from you. Drop us a comment on Instagram at Shimachu Podcast or send us an email at Shimachu Podcast at gmail.com. You can also leave a voice recording through SpeakPipe on our Instagram or website. Our music this episode was by Aolani, a Shimachu Kanaka singer songwriter. We featured her song Everything So Serious from the Aolani EP. You can find her on Instagram at Aolani underscore K. Nihei debiru. If you're enjoying these episodes, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts so that we can continue sharing these Okinawan voices and stories to a broader community. And of course, donations via k o f i linked on our website, are always graciously appreciated. This episode wouldn't be possible without our audio production team, Emma Anderson and Joseph Kamiya, as well as our Uchinaguchi specialist, Brandon Ng. Extra gratitude to our volunteers, Adrian Stoya, Kira Usagawa, Harumi Lopez Higa, Akemi, Carol Nakadomari, and Isabella Shiroma. Our team is small but mighty and growing. If you're interested in helping, please contact us. Thank you for listening and stay tuned for the fun fact where we'll introduce our volunteers. Mata yasai! For this episode's fun fact, we'll be featuring hellos and introductions from our growing podcast volunteer team. From helping to draft online content to making episodes accessible in different languages, we are so grateful for them. So, without any further ado, our team. Hi, Sai. I'm Kira Usagawa.、Um, I'm currently residing on the land of the Clackamas Cowlitz Chinook、uh, in Portland, Oregon.、Um, I'm born and raised in Kaneohe, Hawaii.、Um, I Work on the English transcriptions in the podcast.、Uh, if you view it on YouTube, you'll be able to see it.、Um, my ancestral homelands in Uchina are in Shuri、um, and more to be discovered. And、uh, I would say my favorite karaoke song is always my go to is Don't Know Why by Nora Jones. <laughs> Um, me and my dad used to always sing that song growing up together. We sing a lot of karaoke together. So, Hi, Sai. My name is Adrienne Stoya. I'm from Ohlone Land, Bay Area, California.、Um, I do the show notes for the podcast.、Um, we're still working on finding roots back to ancestral land, but my grandmother is from、uh, Honoka,、um, Hawaii. And my go to karaoke song is I Want to Dance with Somebody. Hi, Tai. Soy Harumi Lopez Higa de Lima, Perú, y colaboro con las traducciones al español en Icharibá Show de Podcast. Mis ancestros provienen de Nakagusuku, Tamagusuku y Naja. Una canción que me encanta cantar en los karaokes es For Good del musical Wicked. Hola, mi nombre es Akemi. Nací en Perú, pero ahora vivo en las tierras de los Timucua, los Seminolas, los Mikusuki y los Mascogos, también conocido como el norte de Florida. Estoy ayudando un poquito con las traducciones al español. Mi patria ancestral por parte de mi papá es Shioya en Ogimi, en Uchina, la isla de Okinawa. Y creo que mi canción favorita de karaoke es Bohemian Rhapsody de Queen. Hello, my name is Akemi. I was born in Peru but now live on the lands of the Timilkua, the Seminole, the Mikusuki, and the Muscogo, also known as North Florida. 
I'm here helping out a bit with Spanish translations. My ancestral homeland on my father's side is Shioya in Ogimi in Utina, Okinawa Island. And my go-to karaoke song is probably Bohemian Rhapsody by Queen. Hi, Hi, everyone. I'm Carol Nakadomari, and I'm from Brazil. I joined the podcast volunteer team to help with Portuguese translation and captions for the episodes. I am a fourth-generation Brazilian Luchuan, so my great-grandparents came from the main island of China. But unfortunately, my family don't have records of where exactly, and I am in the process of finding out. For my go-to karaoke song, I want to represent Brazil. So I'll go with a song called Ando Meio Desligado from the band Mutantes. So thanks. Yeah. Obrigada. Hi, Thai everyone. My name is Isabela Shiroma, and I'm the fourth generation of Tinantio here in Brazil. And whenever possible, I help with the translations into Portuguese. My Shito song is Nanjoshi, and... It was hard to choose just one, but my currently go-to karaoke song is Uchinancho Yaibin from KNGEK. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Mataya, Tai!